you see this current scenario a lot of uh, pressure on the ic engine as well the ic engines are going through a toughest uh, challenge of their lifetime there is a question of survival everyone is talking about electric vehicle around or hydrogen fuel cells so the question is whether ic engine will survive this and whether uh, you should continue your uh, work in this area or you should stop uh, working definitely answer is no the seeing the uh, immediate demand or maybe in the near future the ic engine will remain but definitely they will not um, go as they are today definitely there will be changes in their basic design the there will be more electric electrification of the engines uh, so that's what i'm going to explain today uh, if you see this uh, current scenario the future power trends the main problem nowadays is the co2 the co2 is a carbon dioxide and which is emitted by the vehicle and this is basically when the fuel is burned the fuel is a hydrocarbon and when it is burned it produces the co2 and uh, if you see the global uh, co2 values global co2 values if you see uh, they are increasing the ppm i have some small video from nasa which will just which is showing the how the co2 levels are increasing so that i will play next question is the affordability then main main important problem nowadays is the ban on the entries like if you if you must be reading somewhere in the newspaper that uh, ic engines are banned they are not allowed to enter into the uh, major cities let's say now this paris they have stopped uh, entering and they are not allowing this ps as uh, euro 2 euro 3 levels of uh, engines vehicles so all those challenges are there then the next question is the zero impact on the emissions and i will say the wheel to wheel efficiency of the engine so it's not limited only to the engine but the complete overall vehicle and how this vehicle is a uh, vehicle need to improve overall not in terms of only the uh, pollution but overall the complete wheel to wheel efficiency of the vehicle so let's talk about the emission norms as such so when you say the emission norms so what is this emission norms so no emission norms give challenges to the manufacturers and if you see being engineer all engineers work within the boundaries so what are the boundaries currently now let's say in europe nowadays we have this euro 6 d challenge euro 6 d emission norms earlier there was euro 6c then before that euro 5 euro 4 so if you see uh, as those boundaries are becoming tighter the challenges are more to the oems and that fortunately or not uh, i would say fortunately because when the boundaries are tightened when the emission norms are stream becoming stringent then obviously oem has to spend a lot of money on the research and development and that's the way where we engineers get work so that in a in a sense it is a good but why this is happening why that uh, stringent emission norms are coming into the world nowadays if you if you remember 2017 there's an incident call, uh, with the diesel gate and then all of a sudden what happened the attention everyone's attention uh, was there because of this uh, diesel gate issues because the lab emissions and on road emissions there were a lot of variation there was no conformity between the uh, on road emissions and uh, lab conditions and therefore this real driving emission norms rd emission norms came into picture what is this rd emission norms real driving emission norms are nothing but the conformity factor between the lab conditions and on road conditions so now manufacturer has to achieve the same emission norms which they are showing in the lab as they are uh, on the road now if you if you consider this this looks very simple that in the lab uh, if you are getting some emission values and on the road but the problem is in the lab the conditions are controlled the ambient pressures temperature the driver everything is set and then we can estimate where my engine can operate and accordingly i can tune my calibration such a way that i can achieve i can pass this emission norms but when on the road uh i will not care about those emission norms and then i will see that the uh, customer will get the performance the required performance 
but now as those on road emission norms are coming into picture the manufacturer has to show that the uh, emissions which they have shown in the lab are same on the road as well but on the road there are so many uh, variabilities uncertainties the traffic conditions are uh, not same every day the ambient pressures temperatures are not same the driver uh, uh, aggressiveness sometimes the, uh, there are more aggressive drivers some moderate drivers so all those conditions are uh, changing on the road and then therefore the calibration should be uh, robust enough so that all those conditions we can we can achieve and we can consider during the calibration so so that's very important that when the emission norms are changing the challenges to the manufacturers come and when the challenges are there obviously the more r and d so if you see the uh, emission norms in europe it started in 1988 with the euro zero uh, norms followed by subsequently stringent standards and if you see the world around many countries follow the european norms or us norms if you consider this china this china they are considering the now this uh, china six what they call it it's like a mixture of uh, european and us emission norms but if you see the countries like brazil or some let's say other countries many of the countries they follow either us epa norms or european norms now in europe now here is the current scenario is that there is euro 6 norm now if you see euro 6 there are so many euro 6 levels euro 6 c Euro 6D. Now they are talking about Euro 6E, and in future after that, there is talking about they are talking about the Euro 7 emission norms as well. And the main challenge nowadays is this uh, on-road emission norms for conformity factor with this lab emissions, which started here in Europe in 2017. And uh, now the manufacturer has to show that the same emission norms are there on road and as uh, uh, on road as the lab. so now what are the impact due to emission norms as i mentioned when you say the conformity with the lab emission values obviously it's not that easy uh, that the same emission norms you can achieve you have to consider so many variations on the road and accordingly the calibration should be robust so the next question is emission versus performance because as a customer customer is more interested on the performance he is he is more uh, worried about the fuel mileage is more worried about the uh, acceleration of the engine and as a manufacturer they have to achieve the emission so there is always a trade off between this to emission and performance so it's very challenging to achieve both then uh, as the boundaries are becoming very short or tightened this advanced combustion concept uh, such as this uh, homogeneous compression charge ignition hcci or uh, pcci concept or i would say this uh, gasoline compression ignition gci concept or if you if you if you are reading this uh, technology from uh, mazda sky active so they have the variations they have the base combination of the diesel and gasoline combustion so uh, technology such as spcci so all those combustion concept people are now exploring to their limit and uh, because as it is a question of the survival of the ic engine and the industry based on that people are exploring this advanced materials so that the in cylinder pressures can now go up to 200 bar 250 bar 300 bar the manufacturing techniques they are changing so that the friction losses everything will come down the weight of the engine will come down and obviously the calibration methodologies because if you are considering so many parameters the conventional calibration methodology is definitely uh, there won't be uh, there will be definitely a challenge that how to calibrate all those things i can see so many people uh, i think from india they are joining uh, bs6 is there uh, now the emission norms they are coming in bs6 april 2020 now there is uncertainty because of this corona everywhere all over the world no one is exactly knowing when it will go but uh, i was reading that ps6 is going to be implemented in april but now no one is sure there is no news as of now but this bs6 and then beyond emission norms now bs6 is the start where they will uh, india is following this european norms and slowly slowly they will tighten those norms in bs6 so 23 there will be rd emission norms will be coming to india 
so all the challenges need to be handled so that in a short time they can calibrate the vehicle for different different uh, uncertainties on the road the next is very important is this electrification now what is happening to electrification is nothing but if you see uh, now just to give you example of uh, this injection site injection fuel injection pump earlier fuel injection pumps were mechanical and now they every everywhere if you see the their electronic fuel injection so similarly there is possibility that we can the water pump can be electric the oil pump can be variable oil pump there can be lot of electrification in the component the turbochargers can be electric turbochargers so it's something like a hybrid so that's what called electrification it doesn't mean the pure electric vehicle but the electrification of the components and the engine as such so it can be hybrid so there can be different levels of hybrid p0 p1 p2 depending on the application so that's increasing now let's let's talk about this european norms uh, now if you see this european norms in the passenger category and this heavy duty category if you see as i mentioned 2017 it started with the euro 6d temp so if you see this euro 6 started in somewhere in 2014 so then 6b then 6c then 6d then now 6d so they different level no need to get confused with this 6d 6c uh, is nothing but uh, at different levels of uh, rd they have reduced so conformity factor as i mentioned this real driving emission nox so nox plus uh, nox values the conformity factor is 1.43 it means what let's say if the emission norms says that the lab condition should be let's say 100 g then on road it is allowed to go up to 143 it cannot cross 143 so these levels they are changing and in future they are planning that day there will be exactly conformity factor of 1 is to 1 so the same lab condition should they should achieve on the road as well Now the next important challenge here we we see as an industry is the CO2. If you see this 130 gram per kilometer CO2 uh, uh, is going to 95 gram per kilometer CO2. So now this is very challenging because CO2 uh, we can reduce only if we can we can increase the fuel efficiency or fuel mileage. So in a way it is forcing the manufacturers to come up with the good mileage vehicles so that the mileage will be good and overall the fuel consumption will be less and accordingly the co2 values will go down similarly in the heavy duty as well so there is the co2 limits and then there is a talk about the euro 7 as well in the year 24 25 let's see what is what is the direction so if i talk about this passenger cars passenger cars european norms uh this is a for positive ignition engines and compression ignition this this uh, you will get uh, on net all the details uh, if you go to any site diesel net or any uh, european uh, jrc you can find all the details uh, what are the norms Now if you see uh, this positive ignition gasoline means where there is a, a spark plug so if you see this particular numbers has been added, added after 2014 so this particular numbers are nothing but this pm and uh, this particular numbers are the numbers of those particular matter and then you have to count those similarly for ci engine also uh, there is addition of particulate number and that particular number addition in the gasoline engine is more challenging with the gdi concept because in gdi the particular numbers are more and then the uh, industry or oem has to use uh, gpf gasoline particulate filter so now there is a lot of research people are doing then how they can avoid gpf and still they can go with the gdi so a lot of research is going in that direction in diesel particulate number is not a challenge because uh, in diesel engines soot particles are always on higher side and then to tackle that always dpf is there diesel particulate filter and which reduces the particulate number as well but that is not a case with the si engine si engines uh, gpf is not a compulsory but being uh, part, because of no particular number gpf is becoming compulsory so that is a, some additional component to the to the uh, engine so this is about the hd heavy duty uh, if you see this heavy duty there is something called the whsc cycle and whtc cycle world harmonized steady state and world harmonized transient cycle 
So they are the steady state and transient cycles. And then if you see this particular numbers also there, but as I mentioned for heavy duty, this is not a challenging particular number because DPF is always there. So before going to this, I would like to play a small video of uh, this impact of CO2 and NO2. Now what, is ha what has happened because of this uh, Corona impact, a lot of places, a lot of countries, uh, everyone is working from home and then there are less number of vehicles on the road. And that because of that emission level is going down. So that's what uh, they found. I'll just play this. So let's see what's happening. Let's see what is happening over the Italy from uh, from January till March, this is the NO2 level over the Italy in, in the month of Jan and how it is decreased. Second is over the China, satellite images, and then they are combined just to show that how the nitrogen dioxide, this is a major uh, source, this NO2 comes from the vehicles. So the major source of this NO2 is the vehicles or uh, and that's the uh, people are telling that, uh, or legislative uh, bodies are telling that the vehicle need to tackle this NO2 level. Now, unfortunately, because of this um, corona impact, less number of vehicles on the road and then NO2 level has gone down. I'll now play the CO2, carbon dioxide levels, how they are increasing and impact. Okay, so now uh, you may wonder that how it is linked with the today's uh, presentation or today's webinar, but we all stay in one earth, so we cannot isolate the problem of US or Europe or China or India. We have to tackle as a global uh, entity. So all those CO2 levels, if they are increasing, the sum of the part comes down to automotive industry also, that automotive industry has to reduce those CO2 levels. And that's the reason if you see this CO2 norms are becoming stringent from 130 gram per kilometer, now it is 95 gram per kilometer and in future it may even decrease. So once that legislation comes to achieve those norms, as a manufacturer, you have to achieve those because if you don't achieve those, there is a penalty or it's like you cannot sell your product in the market. So it's that simple. So now let's see how this, uh, uh, how, how industry is tackling all those issues. Like, because there are so many things it has to tackle. It has to tackle with the emission norms. It has to tackle with the fuel legislation norms. It has to tackle the customer demands of performance. So, and then again, it has to be uh, the cost effective solution at the same time. So one of the method nowadays is a popular or maybe it's like in Europe, a lot of OEMs have already used is the virtual calibration as the way to tackle the challenges. Now, what is the virtual calibration? Now, virtual calibration, as I mentioned, uh, calibration is nothing but we have to achieve the specific set of inputs for our required target. So if I take the example of passenger car, a gasoline engine. In gasoline engine, there can be variability of, let's say, intake throttle wall. There can be variability of the VG, VGT, variable geometry turbine. There can be a variation in the EGR percentage, the spark plug timing, the fuel quantity, the air quantity, the variable wall timing. So there can be so many variables, right? And there has to be one set of combination for one particular operating point. So when the engine is operating at one particular speed and top, there should be one set of input. Then only there won't be any uh, fluctuations in the output. So it is nothing but the calibration in the simplest way. I'll go in more detail in the few, next few, few slides. So when you say the virtual calibration, now imagine if I do everything on the physical bed, test bed, definitely I cannot uh, achieve the required accuracy or required robustness in a short time. And there has to be some methodology, something like a virtual calibration. So in virtual calibration, the engine or the, the vehicle is not real. It is a plan model or say the simulation model or it's a mathematical model. So it can be from any software. It can be from uh, 
methods matlab simulating model it can be from gt power it can be from record of bayo it can be from evl or there are so many softwares available uh, for 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 such uh, uh, model plant model development so now here we are replacing the physical engine or after treatment devices or vehicle with the mathematical model and when i say that the plant model becomes the heart of the virtual calibration because if i make any mistake in my model obviously my calibration won't be correct so now it's the heart of the virtual calibration is the plant model and then plant model has to capture the right physics and still run fast so now right physics what do you mean by physics so there are different physics which is happening in the in the uh, in the plant model or in the real engine so there is a heat transfer there is a chemical reactions combustion kinetics after treatment devices and if i miss those uh, physics if i don't capture those correctly then definitely uh, my model will not behave correctly so that's what we are coming back to simulation approach i would say this today's uh, focus is on the euro 6 calibration the current challenges how it is going through the different uh, challenges because of this legislation norms and then how they have handled this and then in future what is going to happen so the if i talk about the simulation models it's nothing but a mathematical models and then it has to capture the real physics so the real physics can be heat transfer it happens in the exhaust manifold water jacket the chemical kinetics in cylinder after treatment fluid mechanics pipe pressure losses pore geometry so it can be 1d or it can be very detailed 3d three dimensional as well but it it is more than the cad then you require some uh, knowledge or some uh, knowledge to to operate those softwares because if there's a because these analysis tools are nothing but a mathematical model model if you provide the input they will solve and give you the output if it's a garbage in definitely it is a garbage out so engineering knowledge is much to operate this software so let's talk about the gt power today uh, the one d simulation tool it can handle the on highway vehicles off highway vehicles marine and rail power generation aerospace industrial machinery for more details you can go to their site and you can find the different different applications based on your interest so or uh, being a system simulation tool it is not limited to one particular domain but it is like where there is a fluid mechan fluid uh, it can handle that completely so capabilities if you see the gt power uh, it, as i mentioned we can even handle this um, uh, related to uh, fea cfd thermal side or even if you can handle this uh, related to chemistry the battery management system even the hybrid complete motor development everything we can do as per your interest mm -hmm.